So this, these um, last two lines, did you see those? Breathe on me, breath of God, fill me with your life, that I may love what thou dost love and do what thou wouldst do. We're going to read the story of Peter in a second, um, split it in half and kind of work through it as we go through the evening. But really, this is the challenge for Peter in the story this evening, to love what God loves and so do what God does. So keep that in mind as we go. And we'll look at Acts chapter 10. If you've got a Bible with you, um, looks like it'll be on the screen as well. But if you've got a paper Bible or you want to follow along at home, Acts chapter 10. And we're going to read the whole chapter in the end. Um, but start from verse 1. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort, Italian regiment, a devout man who feared God with all his household gave alms generously to the poor, and prayed continually to God. About the the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius. And he stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? He said to him, Your prayers and your giving have ascended as a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and bring one man named Simon, who's called Peter. Now pause for a second. The places we've heard so far, Caesarea and Joppa, what kind of places are those? Well, they're seaside towns. Caesarea was a big military port that the Romans had built, named it after Caesar. Caesarea, it's kind of not a particularly creative name, but that's what they called it, where they would ship in all of the legionaries, um, soldiers who were coming to that part of the empire um, to make sure that they behaved themselves. So it's a big port city town. That's where... Um, Cornelius, the centurion, is based. And Joppa as well. If you know the story of Jonah, that might ring a few bells. It's a city on the coast, on the beach. So as we're reading through the story, as you're imagining it, you're supposed to be feeling the sea breeze in your hair, a little faint smell of fish in the air maybe, of sand in your sandals, um, that kind of thing. It's a fresh sea breeze story that's actually all about the sea, or at least who lies across across the sea. So that's where we are. Okay, imagine that. Sea breeze is in your hair. This is a coastal story. Cornelius has this vision. Send um, people to go and get Simon called Peter, who is staying in Joppa. He's lodging with Simon the Tanner, verse 6, whose house is by the sea. There we go. When the angel who spoke to him had departed, he called two of his servants and a devout soldier from among those who attended him. And having related everything to them, he sent them down to Joppa. It's a couple of days' journey. It's about 30 miles, so a good long hike. The next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. And he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance and saw the heavens opened and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners onto the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I've never eaten anything that is common or unclean. The voice came to him again a second time, What God has made clean, do not call common. These happened, this happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once to heaven. So this is not a story if you're a vegetarian. Uh, one, one for you. Peter sees this vision of lots of animals, unclean animals, being let down in a big kind of blanket sheet, sail kind of cloth from heaven. And he's a good Jewish man, brought up in the Jewish ways, as many Jews are still today, to eat what's kosher, to eat what's clean. And so you don't eat things like lobster or bacon or, I don't know, there's all sorts of other things that you shouldn't eat, snakes or camels or horses or dogs or strange things like that that probably we wouldn't want to eat anyway. But Peter, through his whole life, has kept all of those rules. And so he hasn't eaten the things that he shouldn't eat. And now God comes to him and says, you should eat those things. You see, there's something else going on here. We'll see it as we carry on reading. Those laws weren't just about the food that you could eat. They're really, really, they're about the people that you spend time with. Because those rules, those laws, were part of a bigger set of laws in the Old Testament that marked out the people of God that showed who were God's people and who weren't. 
Okay, so the food laws about what you eat and what you don't, this is an important thing. They're not just about what you have for breakfast or not allowed to have for breakfast. They're really about the kinds of people that you're allowed to have or um, that God says are allowed to be in the community of Israel. Because this community are the people who God makes his promises to. So we need to make sure we know who are the people who God is working amongst, who God is keeping his promises to, and who are the people who aren't. Okay, the food laws are really important, but they're really about people, not just food. Okay, keep that in mind as we go on. So Peter has this strange vision about eating bacon uh, on the beach, and while he's inwardly, verse 17, we'll pick it up, inwardly perplexed as to what on earth the vision that he'd seen might mean, behold, the men who were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house, stood at the gate, right on time. And they called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. While Peter was pondering the vision, the spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. Peter went down to the men and said, I'm the one you're looking for. What's the reason for your coming? They said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man, who's well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. So he invited them in to be his guests. The next day he rose and went away with them. Some of the brothers from Joppa accompanied him. And on the following day, they entered Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up saying, stand up, I too am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many persons gathered. He said to them, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. I asked them, why are you sent for me? Cornelius said, four days ago, about this hour, I was praying in my house at the ninth hour. It's about three in the afternoon. And behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your arms have been remembered before God. Send therefore to Joppa and ask for Simon, who's called Peter, lodging in the house of Simon, a tanner by the sea. So I sent for you at once and you've been kind enough to come. Now, therefore, we are all here in the presence of God to hear all that you've commanded, uh, that you've been commanded by the Lord. We'll pause there for a second. This is an extremely important story in our history, the history of the church. That's what the book of Acts is. Um, It's the origin story of us. This is the story within that bigger story that that shows why it's possible for us to be doing this evening what we've been doing this evening. If you're like me, you're not of Jewish origin. Maybe there are a few uh, among us who are. But I'm not. I'm a Gentile. I'm somebody who wasn't raised um, in a Jewish home, don't have any Jewish bloodline as far as I know. And so this story teaches us, people like me, and I imagine people like most of us, how we can come to the God of Israel, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of Abraham. How we can come to, to him, the God of that people, and worship him as our God and know that we're his people. Or how we can come to Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews, and call him our king, that he's the king of the king of all, the king of the nations. How can that happen? That the God of the Jews, the king of Israel, might be our God and our king too. Well, it's because of this story. It's because of Cornelius. So there's three things that I want you to see. It's always three, isn't there? But three big things we're going to have a look at this evening. One is that we all need each other. In this church of God, we need each other. Number two, we all need Jesus. However good you are, you need Jesus. That's what Cornelius and his story particularly shows to us. And the third is that God builds his church. Okay, they don't really alliterate or anything, so you'll just have to work harder to remember them. But first of all, we need each other. How do we see that in the story? Well, can you see how Luke has written it? Luke is a doctor. Luke's a, a very clever, very, very well-educated man who's put together an orderly account of the early church. He's put it together very carefully. And how has he written this story? Well, did you see how many times it switches angle? Uh, how many times they repeat things to each other? Um, how many times, first, Cornelius has kind of half the story, 
except it's not really half the story. It's just an instruction. Go and find this man called Peter. And then Peter has his little bit of the story. And in the meantime, there's other characters coming to fill in their little bit of the story. And then once they meet and they get together and go back to meet Cornelius, then they have to explain ourselves to him. And he explains himself to us and then asks, what have you got to bring me? And we'll get to that in a second. But do you see the way that Luke has written the story? He's showing that all these different people in the church have their little portion of what God has given to them. And what they need to do is put it all together into one big whole. They all have a little portion of the story. A vision here, an instruction there, um, a dream there, an explanation, a sermon here. They all have a little part of it and they put it together and make a big whole because what's God doing in this story? Taking two groups of people who used to be separate and making them one whole. God is matchmaking. Did you see that? Cornelius, the Gentile, this person who comes from far away across the sea, who's part of the kind of wild, churning mass of all the humanity in the world, a bit like the sea, who don't know God, who are just wandering about their own merry way. That's who Cornelius is, from far, far away. But God takes him and matches him together with very tidy, religious, well-brought-up Peter, puts them together and says, really, you can only have one whole church when you have very, very different people meeting together. That's what God's church is, Gentiles plus Jews, his special people from the Old Testament, plus his special people from everywhere else brought together into one. God is matchmaking. Can you see that in the story? All of us have a part to play. We need each other. So what's your part? What is it that you know about the Lord Jesus? What is it that he's brought you in terms of comfort this past week or this past year or, or through your life so far? What is it that he's given you in terms of knowledge or experience or what gift is it that you have that you can use, in fact, that you must use for the good of the other people in this church and in God's church in all the world? Do You see, it's not just Cornelius and Peter who have a little bit of the story, a little part to play. It's every single one of us. Paul, another apostle, later on in um, other letters in the New Testament, he picks up that famous picture of the body and says, all of us in his church are one body. Some of us are eyes, some of us are stomachs, some of us are feet, some are hands, some are skin, some are liver. So I, I don't know, you can build out the picture and the metaphor all you like and say, to say that we all have a part to play. None of us should look down on the others and say, oh, you don't really belong. This church is only for Jews, thank you very much. See what's, what they do in chapter 11, and Peter has to put them straight. Or the other way around, push other people out because they're too religious. This is a Gentile church. Or this is only for us. I imagine we wouldn't do that, but maybe we do it in other ways, in our thinking, if, if not out loud, because we sort of know how to control ourselves, don't we? But, but is there a divide in our churches between poorer people and wealthier people? between older people and younger people, between those who've been a part of the church for years and years and years who are here from the very beginning and those who've just arrived in the last couple of weeks. Do we have any favorites? Well, Peter says in the very next verse, in verse 34, truly I understand that God shows no partiality, that he doesn't show favoritism. That's the whole point of that illustration of the animals that he was supposed to eat, is that God isn't just letting you have bacon for breakfast now. No, he's saying that you should include all kinds of people. Do you see that? Let me tell you a story. If you're a dog owner, this is not a happy story. I hope it won't give you nightmares. I'm sorry about this. But it's a helpful thing to get us feeling what they're feeling in the story. Okay, I, I grew up in Southeast Asia, in Indonesia. That's why I was born um, and raised. And we had one cat through pretty much that whole time and three dogs. The dogs never really lasted very long because in Indonesia, dogs behave a little bit like cats do here. They wander the streets and then come back in the evening for supper and they sleep in the kennel and then they disappear again in the day and you could take them for a walk, but really, to be honest, they take themselves for walks and then come back and just, um, they're kind of outside things, a bit more like cats are mostly in this country. So we lost a couple of dogs because of that kind of thing. One ate rat poison on the rubbish dump and didn't last very long. Another one picked up some kind of um, stomach kind of disease and then only lasted a couple of months. Roly, poor thing, didn't really get beyond the puppy. And then Roy, Roy lasted a long time because my dad, when he picked up the same, when Roy the dog picked up the same illness that um, 
role he had had, who died. My dad went to the little uh, kind of hospital thing down the road with my little sister, described the symptoms that the dog had, and said that my sister had them. They gave him some medicine, and he fed it to the dog, and, and it worked, and the dog was fine and survived. But then, a few years later, after Roy had been with, with us many happy years, on Christmas Eve, he disappeared, as most dogs do in Indonesia, but he didn't come back in the evening. Didn't come back on Christmas Day or on Boxing Day. Just didn't come back. We never saw him again. A few days, I can't remember exactly how long later, my dad was talking to a neighbour whose dog had also disappeared, who'd been talking to a na- other neighbours pet, whose pet dogs had also disappeared, which was strange because all of the wild kind of um, mangy stray dogs hadn't disappeared, just the nice plump pet dogs had. He was talking to another neighbour who had discovered that the police had pulled over a group of people from a village on the other side of our island who had in the back of their van lots of dogs uh, in sacks, uh, ready to be taken away and enjoyed for Christmas dinner in the village the other side of the island. If that makes you feel a little bit queasy, a little bit angry, a little bit, how on earth could people do that? Well, that's what Peter and many Jewish people would have felt about eating food, like the stuff Peter saw in his vision. But more importantly than that, whatever you're feeling right now, it's what they felt about other people about the Gentiles. It wasn't just about food, do you see that? But these were people who were beneath them. Shouldn't have been like that. It really shouldn't have been like that. There's plenty of Old Testament prophecies about how it wouldn't be like that. Isaiah chapter two, perhaps you read or heard a portion of this this morning um, in remembrance. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills and all nations will flow to it. That's what Isaiah said. Many peoples will come and they'll say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall decide disputes for many peoples. They'll beat their swords into plowshares, they'll sp- their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, neither shall they train for war any more. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Psalm 27 says that the nations will stream to the mountain of the Lord, and they'll see him, his holy city, his place. All the peoples from every tribe and tongue and nation, from every corner, will come to him, and And yet here, God's people, even Peter himself, have this kind of gag reflex when it comes to even eating with, being close to, even going to the same house as somebody who's like that. I wonder if we have anything like that in the church or around our church so that people who are like that, who've done that, who've been there, who look like that, we would love to say they're welcome, but to be honest... They're not really. We have a little bit of an awkward kind of a thing when we consider those kinds of people, whoever they might be, coming to our church. Is that in your heart? We need to ask the Lord to help us to see if that's the case, because it shouldn't have been like this. They should have been going and eating with others and welcoming them to come and meet Jesus, and yet there was this tradition, this thing. It's almost become a law in the reading where Peter says, we just don't do this. It's a really strange thing for a Jewish man to come and eat with people like you but we need each other. And God is working. What's his heart? If we went to go back to those first verses, don't worry about doing it right now. That first verse of that song, what is God's thing that he really loves? Well, he loves the nations. He loves the people of God, his people from every tribe and tongue and nation. What does he want to do? What is he doing? Well, through Peter, he's bringing them close. He's bringing them to the table. He's taming the wild Gentiles, those people who had no idea about him. And he's bringing them in to belong on his farm. Peter's fishing in the sea for people. He's, with the keys of the kingdom, opening the door to the most unexpected people. So you see, we need each other in the church. I need you. You need me. You can look around at everybody else and all the folks listening online, everybody who's part of this body here. You need each other to be around for each other, to give your gifts and service and the words you know about Jesus to each other so that we might be one whole together. God has match-made a church for himself here in Fladach. 
I wonder what your part is to play in that. Okay, we need each other. Let's carry on and see that we all need Jesus. That's the second point. Carry on with the reading. So Peter opens his mouth and said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. Think about what that means in a second. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all, you yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee, after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and made him to appear. Not to all the people, but to us who'd been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he'd risen from the dead. So it wasn't everyone, but actually it was about 400 people in total, um, if you read the other accounts of it. But carrying on, we were the ones who saw him after he rose from the dead, and he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. To him all prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still saying these things, this is an amazing thing. The Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who'd come with Peter, that's the Jews, were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speak in different languages and extolling God, praising, worshipping him. Then Peter declared, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who've received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to remain for some days. That's Peter's sermon to the Gentiles, his good news to people who'd already heard about Jesus. You hear that? He said, you already know about this man who was raised up in Galilee, who did amazing things, that God was with him through the Holy Spirit. But there's other things you don't know. What you need to know is, right at the very end, Everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name, through what he did, through who he was, through all that he is today. Anybody who calls on him can be forgiven. In fact, there's no other name that you can call on by whom you will be forgiven. Jesus is the one who's Lord of all. He's the only one who can bring peace. These are a couple of the things that Peter said. He's the only one who's defeated that oppressor, the devil. He's the only one who was raised up and killed for our sins. And then the only one who three days later came out the back door of death, broke through it and went the, out the other side so that we can have hope for the future. You see, there's nobody else but Jesus and all of us need him, however good you are. Cornelius was a good man. Okay, this is what he teaches us. He was somebody who was pretty good at his career. He, he was a centurion, over at least 100 men. Uh, and there would have been a, a few groups of, of hundreds in a legion. And so um, Cornelius is a, a, a pretty important guy. Done well in his career. But not only that, the people who he was oppressing now quite like him. Do you see that in the story? He's a Roman. He's here to occupy the people of Israel and take this land by force. He's one of the occupiers. But they actually quite like him. He's well known uh, among the people. Why? Because he fears God. He honors, believes in, respects their own God. Has somehow sort of become one of his followers. He even prays at the right time of day. Three in the afternoon was when you would... If you were living in Jerusalem, go up to the temple. If you weren't, you'd go up onto your roof. You'd maybe burn some incense if you were in the temple, or your prayers would be the incense if you were up on your roof at home. And you would pray at that time, and everybody in Israel would pray. It's what Daniel did, if you know that story. That's when he would go up and open his windows facing Jerusalem and pray. It's what they all did. And so he's become somebody who's following God, who believes in God, who's even praying, even giving and doing good to the poor, but it's not enough. Can you see that? God has gone to all the trouble to arrange for Peter to go and tell him what he's missing. And what is somebody who believes in God, who even prays at the right time of day, who even gives to the poor, 
and does good deeds. What's somebody like that missing? Well, they're missing everything. They're missing Jesus. They're missing the one who's come to bring peace as the Lord of all. Peace between us and peace between us and God. They're missing the one who would come and and defeat that oppressor, the devil. That's in verse 38. Jesus came out and did uh, wonderful miracles, healed people, turned the world the right way up again, um, got rid of evil and darkness, crushed Satan under his feet. Satan, the one who accuses us, who puts little thoughts in our minds, who tells us that God doesn't really love us, that he's not really there at all. The one who accuses us and says, you're not good enough for him. He could never accept you. What you have to do at best is just work really hard all your life. And maybe, perhaps maybe, if you're good enough, he'll let you into heaven. That's the kind of thing the devil says. Comes along and puts chains around us. Sometimes religious-shaped chains. Sometimes temptation-shaped chains. Sometimes all sorts of different ways. Drags us off and oppresses us and keeps us far from God. That's what the Gentiles were. Literally far across the sea. Spiritually far under the devil. But what does Jesus come to do? He comes to free you, to bring you peace, to come and get rid of him by doing what? By dying on the cross. Who else has done that? Who else has given their life for you? Who else has used all their power? God's unlimited power in the universe as the creator. He used his power to give himself blood to make himself human, to give himself blood. But what would he do with that blood? Why did he do it? Well, so he could pour it out again. Who used all his power to give himself mortal life. Why? So he could lay it down again. Do you know anybody like that? Have you ever come across any God like that? He's the only one there is who would give his life for you. He's the only one who would pour out his own blood for you to cleanse you, to forgive you from sin. And then three days later, it's the only one who's ever been through death and out the other side, never to die again. The only one who can give you that kind of hope. The only one who can rescue people who are far away, who are even so far that they're still in the grave. Jesus is the only one who can rescue us from death and bring us out the other side into life. He's the only one who can forgive. The only one who can give the Holy Spirit He's the one that all those prophecies about people streaming to the mountain, streaming to the temple, streaming to the city. It's all about him, that they would stream to the city where he was crucified, to the city where he rose again, to the city this whole world will one day be, this city of God where Jesus will come and rule forever. You see, we need Jesus. It's not good enough to be a good person. Even if you're as good as Cornelius, great at your job, respected by people who should, by all rights, hate you, and even being quite religious and believing in God. It's not enough to have a vague belief in God out there. It's not enough to pray generally to God out there. It's not enough even to do really good stuff like giving to the poor. What you need is to come and know Jesus. And all those things fall into place. You come and get to know God as your own father, not just as someone you believe in, but as your own father. You come to love your neighbor as yourself to be able to pour out way more than money to those around us. You can really do some good. And then when you pray, you pray to him as your father, walking into his presence, not as a distant God who might hear you possibly if you're good enough, but as the father who welcomes you to come and sit on his lap and enjoy his presence. See, we need Jesus, however good we've been, however bad we've been. He's our only hope. Now, last point. Well, perhaps you might feel discouraged. How can somebody like me, not even close to Cornelius, ever be a part of God's church? How can somebody like me ever be brought in from outside, from across the sea, to be a part of God's people? How can it work? Well, because God is the one who builds his church. Did you see who's behind everything in the story? I hope you've seen it as we go through so far. God is the one who gives Cornelius his vision. God is the one who prompts him to send people to go and find this man. He gives them the name of who, who he's going to, um, to find. He actually says that. Uh, in verse 20, I am, the one who, I am the one who has sent them. God is not Cornelius who sent, really. It's God who's been working in the background to send these men to Peter. 
what's he done with Peter? Peter's had his vision, and he's wondering what's happening, and at exactly the right moment, as he's still chewing it over in his mind, knock on the door, and a voice, the Spirit, speaks to him, go with them, these people, I've sent them. And then so he goes, and God is the one who's behind everything, brings him into Cornelius' house, explains and helps Peter understand that vision, gives him words to say, is the one who called Peter from being a fisherman to go and be fisher of men, to witness his resurrection and deny him at his crucifixion, to be around at the barbecue on the beach when he was put back together again, forgiven, and then sent out, sent out to the nation, sent out across the seas to bring in a big catch of fish for God for God's glory. You see, God is the one who's behind everything. He's the one who, halfway through Peter's sermon, halfway through a sentence, the Holy Spirit is sent by God to fill these people. Peter hasn't asked for it. Peter hasn't been laying his hands on people. Peter hasn't baptized anybody yet. It just happens halfway through his sermon. God is the one who's done it all. Do you see that? He's the one who always does it all. So if you're discouraged by your own sin and think, how could I ever get close to Cornelius, let alone get close to being with Jesus. Well, you can because he's the one who does it. He's the one who cleans us up through his own son, who raises us up through his own resurrection and gives us his spirit to live with us. God is the one who does it in us. He's also the one who does it in the churches. So are you discouraged by the empty seats here this evening? Honestly, putting on a brave face but discouraged? Are you discouraged by just walking around Cledach or Ammonford? or any town in Wales, and seeing all the doors that are shut on the chapels that used to be full of light and life. I was in a pastor's meeting the other day, and there's, most of us are kind of in our 30s, like young men, and there's one guy in his 70s, um, Gareth Cheedy, I don't know if you know him, he's a, he's a legend, a minister in the Baptist church in Ammonford. When he was younger, he said, he used to be part of the kind of Ammonford group of pastors who met together to pray, and there were 18 of them all together. And now there's him in the kind of traditional chapels, 18 of them together. And now there's him and one other guy who's the minister of the Welsh Baptist Church in Ammonford. And then a few others of us as part of kind of independent churches now. But that's in living memory, not long ago. I wonder how much that kind of thing discourages us. And we look around and we think, well, perhaps they're right. Perhaps the church is something for a bygone age that we should just grow up and move on from. Please don't do that. This is... God's bride. This is his temple. We are his people. However much we feel scattered, however much we feel like the walls of Jerusalem have been crumbled down and the gates burned with fire, we should pray he gives us the heart of Nehemiah to be spending our lives rebuilding and praying and working hard with a plan to put things back together again. But as we work, as we pray, as we hope, this is our hope, isn't it? That God is the one who's the builder. That as we build, he's the master builder behind it all. That as we go out, the gates of hell won't prevail against us because we know who's our captain. We know who's our savior. We know who's our husband who hasn't left us alone, who hasn't left us to our own devices, but who's with us, who walks with us, especially in our suffering because it's then that we feel his suffering and really trust in him. So don't be discouraged. When you go out and see those closed doors, would you let them turn you to prayer and to remember this evening that God is the one who builds his church in his time, in exactly the perfect right timing. He's the one who does it and the gates of hell will never prevail against her. So what do we do? Well, there's three things, right? Be encouraged. He's the one who builds his church. I wonder if you want to be a part of that. You really must be a part of that because we need each other Every single one of us, whatever you have to give, God has given it to you to give to us, to put together into the pot, stir it all up, and then we have a church. We need each other, we really do. But most of all, we need the Lord Jesus.